Thank you. I'm Sonoko Sakai. Thank you. Uh, I call you guys Googlers. Without you, my life will be very different. So thank you, first of all, <laughs> for making things so accessible, um, including the ingredients that I'm presenting here, because some of them come from far away from Japan. And because of Google, I could just you know, find these ingredients when I want to. I also source them locally. But uh, today, what we're going to be focused on is, is on the Japanese pantry, namely dashi. But if I speak of dashi, I also have to talk about the fermented seasonings because it's together, you know, combined that we um, make the base of our, our seasonings. But dashi is very, very important. Um, does anybody know what dashi means? Okay, if you, so in Italian cooking, what would be the most important ingredient that you would name if you were gonna start cooking? Olive oil, right? So our culture is about stock. We don't start with oil. Even though I brought a bottle of sesame oil, see that's kind of left on the right side. We basically cook with water and we make a stock. And that stock becomes the base of all the foods that we uh, cook with. And, um, and the reason why we like the stock, because it's gentle, it's kind of like the supporting actor in a uh, movie. You know, it's kind of not the, the, the superstar, like the big fish or the big piece of meat, but it's supporting it. It's enhancing the flavor without standing out. So uh, the word that we like to use um, for this flavor is umami, and there's several um, ingredients that bring out umami. You probably already know them, but um, I'm gonna go through them right now, and with these, um, five ingredients, I'm going to show you a couple different ways to make dashi, and then we're going to um, make a miso soup. But the dashi, I'm going to let you t taste plain. I'm going to let you taste the vegan dashi, and I'm going to let you taste one that's made with bonito flakes and kombu. So these are uh, so the two popular ones that we have. Um, and then I'll season it with some homemade miso, and then we'll make a inari zushi, also using kombu as the base of the stock, and then you'll get to taste it with a pickle that was also seasoned in stock, kombu stock. So um, stock is everywhere. Uh, and I could just keep going. First, let me talk about kombu. Have, has anybody cooked with kombu? OK, so kombu is my favorite dashi ingredient. This kombu is very special. I don't know if you've seen a really long one like this. This can be as tall as you. One tall American, like six feet tall. Uh, and this is, um, this is Laosu kombu from the peninsula of Laosu in Hokkaido. Most of the really premium kombus come from Hokkaido because that's where the cold waters in Siberia, the different currents meet and makes it very habitable, a pleasant habitat for the kombu. And so this one is particularly good. It was cured three years. So it's not like you could just go out to the beach and pick a kombu and think you've got you know, something for stock. The Japanese people, uh, the kombu artisans, will carefully go through and cure, cure them. And also, see these? Like This is a Rishidi from the Rishidi Peninsula. Compared to this one, uh, these are much skinnier. So just among the kombu varieties, you're going to have you know, hundreds of which what we probably use about 10 different kinds. So in our Japanese diet, kombu appears almost every day. And uh, without kombu, it's like, for me, not having salt around. You know, It's so essential. And what I did, what you do is you just, you could just do a cold brew and just throw in water and leave it for a few hours or overnight. And you already have a dashi stock, a kombu stock that's vegan, right? Um, you could, uh, so there's kombu, and by the way, see these white spots here? That's the mannitol sugar. This is the natural MSG. You do not want to wipe this off. This is not mold, okay? So maybe if it's harvested here, some of them are sandy, you might want to wipe it clearly, but any rinsing you do with water actually uh, doesn't make kombu that happy. So once it gets cooked, it's, it's basically it. But keep it in a dry place. Uh, it will last you for years, as long as you keep it in a cool pantry. And um, something like this would cost you like $40, so it's not cheap. But what you do is you could cook it and use it 
a couple times and even used a spent one for pickles. So I'm just starting this one with, just with kombu and I'm gonna finish with the other primary um, ingredient for dashi which is bonito. So bonito flakes, have you ever shaved bonito flakes? This is what a bonito, uh, this is one fourth of the filet of a, like a five to seven kilo bonito, like an albacore tuna or yellowfin tuna, bluefin tuna, Th these bluefin tunas are just not the ideal source for making uh, bonito, any, uh, you know, uh, for making, uh, we call it katsobushi, because, of, because they're going ex extinct. So we have to be very careful about w how we source our, um, our bonito flakes. But um, what I want you to remember is in the old days, my grandmother, my mother would shave it. So this would be a, a shaver. There's a little drawer. It's called kezuriki. And see how it's shaved? So what you will do, um, this piece of fish has been um, filleted, cooked, smoked, and inoculated it with a uh, mold. And it's, it takes about six months to make one piece. And it's, can you imagine, one-fourth, it, it shrinks to about one-sixth of its original size, and you only get four pieces out of it. And from one block, you only get about 30 servings of miso soup. So the labor that goes into making a, a, a we call it fushi, is intense. And so they say that in uh, Kagoshima, Makurazaki Peninsula, where all the artisans are, uh, are disappearing. Like my friend who is in this business said that there's only about 27 people left that you could say true artisans. And the way they fillet the fish is so beautiful, they're sculptural that you could actually tell who the artisan is. And I talk about my friend in the book, and um, uh, I wouldn't recommend anybody doing it unless you actually go to a katsobushi shop and and uh, practice it a few times because I'm not good at it. And when I told my husband I was coming to Google with this, Kezuri Bushi, he says, don't let anybody try it. The blade is sticking. My husband's a sculptor, so he d deals with blades all the time. So he's like, too dangerous, too dangerous. So he says, talk about it, but don't try to do it. But um, see the side where the skin is? That's the tail end, and this is the head. So you basically, do it at a 45 degree angle, and without shaving your hand, you, it's, a, it's a motion like this. But you have to really push it down until you get to the point where it's like a ruby red, and you will get shavings like this, you know? And the outer part is kind of um, moldy because they inoculate it with a mold. So you try to get to the bottom, but you could kind of taste what's fresh and then what is not fresh. So try that. You could pass it around and do a pinch. Now what I'm gonna do is, there's about two quarts in here. So it's about one, 20 grams per quart. So it's about 40 grams. This is about 100 grams. You do a lot. My friend will put the whole bag of Bonito in it. And, um, and basically, once the water has already come to a boil, you could either take the kombu out, because some people don't want to mix the kombu with the bonito flakes. They say it uh, has a chemical reaction that uh, makes an inferior dashi, but I don't bother, uh, because I'm more of a noodle maker. I'm more, more of a street food person. But, um, once you put the bonito in, you just let it steep like tea. See, I turned it off, and you just let it wait for two minutes, and then we're gonna strain it. Okay, so that is your katsu bushi, so it's bonito kombu dashi. And um, while this is steeping, I'm gonna talk about the other one. So the other one is a shojin dashi, uh, mushrooms, shiitake mushrooms. Guess, can anybody guess what this is? Nobody? Oh my God, gourd. So it's called kampyo, and if you go to a sushi restaurant, you could get a gourd. It's children's favorite um, hand roll. Um, but the gourd is peeled this way into a spiral, and then it's dried. And it has kind of a lovely, soury, chewy flavor. 
and um, I use it to tie rolls, like cabbage rolls, and it's totally edible, and it makes a very nice dashi. Soybeans, wonderful. Don't use GMO. I use Laura soybeans, and I uh, toast it, and so you lightly toast it in, in a, a frying pan, and then you let it soak like this overnight. I also put here a piece of kombu, see? And the shiitake mushrooms. Did you like that taste? It's nice, right? The shavings are kind of short. You should get really longer curls, but this one needs to be trained, so I haven't quite, quite gotten it there. But So what you do is I soak this overnight, and you just cook it for about an hour, 20 minutes to an hour, and you have beautiful dashi. So what I'm gonna let you do is I'm gonna let you taste it, okay? So this is gonna be cooking. So I have two kinds of dashi here that you're gonna taste. Let me just temporarily. Uh, so we're gonna start with the vegan dashi. The only seasoning I put is a little bit of sea salt, and I always like to put sake. Sake goes into everything. So have you heard of suimono? Is the clear soup. So when you go to like a kaiseki restaurant, like I'm sure all of you went to, have been to Ennaka, right? No? No? <laughs> I thought maybe because it's right here in Culver City. It's a really nice restaurant that has kaiseki, two, two ladies that uh, are chefs. Anyway, they would probably serve a suimono, not a miso soup in the beginning, and they may never serve any miso soup because in a kaiseki restaurant, you want to taste the level, the quality of dashi of the chef. And that will basically determine the udet, which is the skill of the, of the uh, chef. So um, don't be too critical today. <laughs> I'm not like a Michelin three star, I'm a home cook. So anyway, this is really a simple dashi. I could have maybe put, a, um, I may have, I could have put maybe one more uh, shiitake in it, but it's so simple, it's so simple on its own that I want you to just taste it as a, as a broth, okay? But just imagine, they're just vegetables, right? And you know what I do with these uh, spent vegetables? See these? These are the spent uh, kombu, see all these? I don't throw it away. I toss it in my salad. It's, it's, it's really nice. And I, um, I, I cook it with a little soy and mirin and make a little pickle out of it. And you eat it rice, rice and it's wonderful. Okay, so now we have this dashi that's already done. So we're just gonna put it through the filter. So that's number one dashi, okay? And you could use this one more time to make a secondary dashi. But this is the number one dashi. So I'm going to season this one and you're gonna taste this one too. So first you do the vegetarian, the vegan, and the next one we'll do one with fish. Just so you get an idea what you like. And for the miso soup, we made it with a bonito flake. I added some shiitake mushrooms. So you could, you could blend, you could mix and match if you like. And with the a, with a bonito flake, kombu, and shiitake. So um, let me, Season it. I love my bonito flakes. See, that's why I could never be a vegan. Yeah. But if you go to a, a Japanese temple or a nunnery, uh, they, uh, they serve the vegan dashi. All their cooking is based on that, the stews, the pickles, everything. So little, it's, it might be bland if you're, um, you eat meat, but. Okay, so the next one is gonna be the one with the fish. So this um, particular one comes from a single fish, a single fish. And the upper part, it says the upper part of the fish, the white, mostly white, white meat. So you could go to a Japanese artisan Bonito Flakes store it's called Kanzubutsuya, they sell bonito flakes, they sell the, the dry mushroom, all these things you will find in this specialized store. My friend has one called Yagicho and she's featured in, in the book. Um, but they will tell you this part says comes from Kagoshima. So it's single origin, it was cut on a line, 
I mean, Japanese get really, really, you know, anal about these things. And um, we're into single origin chocolates right now, right? And coffee, and we'll get to our bonito flakes soon, right? Um, so when you make a, a suimono, which is the clear soup, you put a little bit of the light color soy sauce. And this is a beautiful artisan soy sauce that I recently discovered, so I use that. So it's still very light because I want you to taste the dashi. Good about the dashi? You understand the dashi, the two different kinds, the cold brew versus this one that is a vegan one that needs to be cooked 20 minutes? It's just amazing how many varieties of dashi you could do. Also, chicken is also, a chicken bone broth is dashi. Pork bones are dashi. So if you go to a tonkotsu ramen place, that's dashi. And if you go to any restaurant, a Japanese person will always look for the flavor of the dashi. I said that dashi is, is what determines the skill level of a chef. And so we, even just, you know, people like me would go into a restaurant and taste the, taste the food and go, ooh, I taste the dashi. It's, it's a phrase called dashi ga kiteru, and we use that all the time. So that's how we're obsessed with the flavor of dashi. Okay, so the next thing I'm gonna do is make miso soup. Do you like miso soup? Does anybody make miso soup at home? Nobody? Oh, sometimes? <laughs> Who has a bonito dashi in their hands already? Which do you prefer? The second one, right? The second one is like deeper, right? Yeah. So, um, but you know, dashi is just a foundation. It's gonna start bland, you're gonna start adding flavor to it. That's why I put the, the five basic seasonings here because Japanese uh, cuisine is often described as a bland cuisine. Actually, some famous food writers said that our cuisine is too bland. Um, well, sure, you know, we don't use garlic that much, and um, we don't mask our um, dishes with a lot of sauces, you know, cream sauces. It's just about enhancing the natural flavor of the food. So over, and we, we're not really, we don't have a tradition of like um, sauteing everything. We tend to boil things. Cause, and, and most people in Japan don't even have an oven. So we tend to boil a lot of things, simmer things, stews. So now what we're doing is um, we're making a miso soup. Miso soup is a breakfast soup. And when I say breakfast soup, um, it could be different things. It could be with tofu. Uh, I have different kinds of vegetables. I added some um, squash and onions. So what I did is I sauteed some onions with a little bit of sesame oil, just to give it a little bit of umami and flavor. And then we're gonna finish it with some uh, scallions. So the Japanese are all about garnishes too. And you don't ever wanna overwhelm your dish with too much garnish, but um, it, also, it always brightens up, the, especially the soup. So you always have some kind of a garnish at the end. So um, this is my homemade miso. This is about nine months old. Um, I teach a miso class um, every year, and it's still young, but I think it has enough umami that I'm going to uh, serve it for the first time. Once you get used to making your own miso, you don't want to use industrial miso anymore. So what you do is you put about a tablespoon for each cup, but every miso is, has different levels of saltiness. Miso is also uh, a key ingredient, one of the five key ingredients in Japanese cooking. Miso, the next one is rice vinegar. Uh, meeting, sake is also meeting. These two are sakes. And then soy sauce, light color and, and dark color. And then we have uh, salt and, salt and uh, sugar. But I consider sake, mirin, and sugar are all sweeteners. The soy sauce gives you saltiness and it, it's um, umami. The rice vinegar gives you a brightness, the sourness. Um, so oil doesn't really get into the picture. It's interesting, you know. Uh, but if you have, but oil has become part of our culture. So I use a lot of sesame oil, untoasted sesame oil for the most part. 
What do you think is a common ingredient in rice vinegar, sake, and soy sauce? Can anybody guess? Rice, yeah. It's fermented rice. It's koji. Koji is the mold that is used to inoculate the rice to create rice vinegar, sake, meeting, and soy sauce. So, and we also eat rice as a, it's, it's the centerpiece of our diet. So basically anything that enhances the flavor of rice is going to um, uh, come to the table. And um, these ingredients complement the rice, okay? So, okay, so this miso soup is ready, I think. And so let's uh, serve this miso soup. Made with American non-GMO soybeans and uh, fermented for about, we started in August. So usually August is not a really good time to make miso because it's a little bit warm. And when it's too warm, uh, it tends to invite other molds into the, the base. So it's, right, right now if it's colder, it's a better time to make miso. So right now, I'm, this is the time when I'm teaching miso classes. So now that I've added the miso to that dashi, you will see that suddenly the flavor will get better, right? It needed that. And what you could do with all this dashi is uh, keep it in the fridge or you could freeze it. So I will um, take this home and I will use it. My husband likes to have miso soup for breakfast every single day. And if it's not there, he's unhappy. So today he got the pumpkin, like everybody else, because I was making it for you guys. Um, but you could go into the fridge and use kale or um, potatoes, sweet potatoes, zucchini. Vegetables uh, work really well with, uh, with miso. So, and you know, if you, the thing you need to remember about miso is you don't want to raise the temperature too high. If it's probiotic. These are not pasteurized. The ones that you buy in the store are usually pasteurized, so it's already dead. But if you want a live miso, don't boil it. Never boil. So it's the last thing I added to my dashi, right? Once you um, know that your vegetables are cooked, turn off the heat and then add the miso, okay? Um, is it good? You like it? Good. Okay. You feel like you're in Japan? <laughs> yeah, this is comfort food, yeah. The, uh, uh, the tofu, by the way, is from Meiji Tofu. Do you know Meiji Tofu? Wonderful artisan tofu uh, in, in Torrance. And you could get it at the, I think, Mar Vista, Mar Vista Farmer's Market. So here we have another secondary dashi. You never throw this away, okay? It's just too good, too precious. So I could freeze this, or I just go ahead and make another batch, and I keep it in my fridge. So I always have something like this ready to go. The next thing I'm gonna do is to make inari sushi. Have you heard of inari? They're actually fried tofu that look like this. And what you do is um, they're pouches, so when you cook it, you cook it with dashi. So I'm using a, a vegan dashi. And I'm gonna add soy sauce. A little bit of brown sugar from Okinawa. And uh, you could also add a little cane sugar. And what you do is in this dashi, seasoned dashi, you cook the tofu. And you season it. And you cook it in this broth until almost all the liquid is gone and then you have a seasoned tofu. So what you're gonna do is you're just gonna put this in there. You could blanch this too if you don't, if you, if you have time, do a little blanch. And then we're just gonna cook this down, you see. You put more dashi if you like. So as you can see, I'm always pouring dashi. You know, dashi's always in my fridge, in a pitcher. I'm adding it to enhance flavors. So it's a really nice, uh, it's basically a seasoning is what it is. And this is gonna be turned down to a simmer. So this is cooking, while this is cooking, um, what you will do is you'll flip it once in a while. Okay. So then we go into making the um, inari sushi. 
a sushi, okay? So uh, sushi is made with seasoned rice, and um, the kombu is actually added while the rice is cooking. So here we go. Do you see the kombu in there? So that means that it becomes a dashi, right? And that's how I season my sushi. I was gonna make this in a beautiful donabe rice cooker, but I realized that we only had an induction oven here. So I decided not to turn it on, but has anybody cooked with a, a donabe? Oh, um, I'll show you the clay pot. It's really pretty for, for cooking rice. It's just one of the best things. Okay, so let me just scoop this rice out. Who owns a rice cooker? Oh, a lot of people, wow. So you eat a lot of rice? You all eat? Whew, it's hot. Okay, so the kombu comes out, you eat it. It's so good. Okay, so I'm just gonna spread it out. So here we have rice vinegar, this beautiful one from Kyoto, some cane sugar, and sea salt. You have to turn this once in a while. So then you mix it. If we had a, a, a fan, we would be fanning it. When you make uh, sushi rice, do not mash it, and you cut it. And you cut it by using an angle. Um, some people would just kind of spread it out. And, and we usually have a fan so that we could cool it down fast. This is called a handai. It's nice uh, because it's wide. And the American bowls are like this. You're trying to cool, cool the uh, rice as quickly as possible. So if you're gonna make sushi, I recommend you get one of these. So uh, the umami and the rice and the umami and the, and the tofu are going to add the flavor. So we use dashi in two places. The last thing we're gonna do is now add sesame seeds. We love sesame seeds. And um, shiso. Have you ever seen a shiso leaf? So this is like our basil, and we just love it on everything. It grows like weeds here. So simple, it's just a vegan sushi, but it's all so colorful, right? Just two ingredients, sesame seeds and shiso, and then the tofu. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna stuff it, and then we're gonna have it with a little pickle. Oh, I know, forgot this one. Ginger. <laughs> I knew something was missing. <laughs> Just chopped in ginger. So actually there's four ingredients. Okay, all right, so let's um, come here. So what you do is you just, uh, you need to wet your hands, so get a ball of water. Do you like spicy too? Okay, so this is a shimmy pepper, so we'll do, so what you're gonna do is take one and you just make a ball, okay? Like a, like an oblong ball, and then you put it in here, like that, okay? There's this and the black sesame, maybe a little bit of both would be nice. We're thinking about presentation too here, so just give him, give him some pickles. That's what makes it pretty. Just one more thing, the last one, this is also in my book, but the amazu pickle is just blanched vegetables. I found uh, broccolini and, uh, uh, what is it called, cauliflower, with vinegar, kombu, chili pepper, sugar, and rice vinegar, mixed together, boiled, and poured over. And um, see the kombu in here? That's the dashi. So you could see that dashi plays uh, is everywhere. And um, I hope that this book will inspire you to try something with, with these ingredients. So let's um, take some questions now. Thanks for the food and the presentation. Um, I always had a question about miso. So when you go to the store, there's all kinds of miso. There's white miso, dark mm -hmm. color miso. Yeah. Which one is the best for the miso soup? Depending yeah. on the region, like if you go to Kyoto, you might find uh, a sweeter white miso called saikyo. And um, it's more rice, more koji than soybeans. 
And if you go to Nagoya, mid regions, it's, there's a hacho miso, which is very dark and made with pure soybeans. There's also barley miso. These tend to be darker misos. If you go to Sendai, to the northern part of Japan, you have um, Sendai miso, which also tends to be a little saltier, and uh, fermentation could also be longer. The white misos are fermented less, six months sometimes. Um, the, like my miso is uh, about eight months, and I'm gonna let it go for several more years. But my students keep eating it, so they never last that long. But, um, so yeah, you, you can uh, mix and match, and the way you do it is blend it. You play with it, yeah. Thank you. Does dashi keep well? Um, how long will it last in a fridge or a freezer? Um, I, I keep it in the fridge for about a week. And uh, you could also keep it in the freezer. You could put it in ice cube trays and just pop it in. That's a really good one. If you're like making miso for one soup for one person, just have that in these ice cube trays. You know those silicone tube? That, that would work. But um, when I was doing a, a, a stage for, uh, with a noodle maker, a soba noodle maker, I'm really into actually soba, by the way, uh, if you ever want to learn how to make soba by hand. Um, he made the dashi every single day. It, it was never frozen, never in the fridge. Every morning, that was the ritual that began in the morning, making dashi before we even made the noodles. So the fresher, the better. Was it pumpkin in the miso soup? Yes, kabocha. Yeah, so um, I've been dealing with those pumpkin. I think they're really tasty, but I wonder how did you cut those pumpkins? How did I cut the pumpkin? Yeah, I, isn't it, was, it horrible when you look at Yeah, it's really hard. Right? I always thought yeah. I'm going to lose a finger or oh, two. Oh, yeah, so if you look at, uh, the, there's a pumpkin instruction in my book, oh. how to cut a pumpkin. Oh, that's great. Yeah, because uh, some people will say, oh, just throw it into the oven and let it roast. No, 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 I want to cut it, you know, because I want to have clean cuts. Yeah. So what you do is you have the pumpkin, you know, the stem usually is taken off already when you buy it. So um, you puncture four holes with your chopsticks right on the top around the stem, and you cut a square. And when you cut a square, you could do it with a, if you're scared to use your knife, you could do it with one of those um, pump, Halloween pumpkin carving knives that has the, the zig, and you cut a square on the top and the bottom, and you push it, take it out, just pry it out, and you'll see that it's all whole. So the meat is about this much. So you take the cap off, the little, little, you know, yeah. the stem part and the little, and then, so now you have a, a square on the top and a square hole on the bottom. And then I take the knife, I, I, I just um, rest my knife against one corner of that square hole uh -huh. and guide my knife down. So you'll see it in uh, s somewhere. If my index is good, and you look under how to cut a kabocha, because that's how I overcame my fear of cutting kabochas, because I wouldn't buy kabocha just because I didn't want to cut it, but it's one of my favorite vegetables, so. See, I'm even wearing a kabocha today. Um, any other tricks you might want to know? For a regular home cook, how yeah. often do you sharpen your tools? How often? Um, well, I have a husband who's a sculptor, right? So he's like, oh God, I can't believe how you take care of your tools. And um, I would say because I teach classes every week, every week, and mine are all carbon steel. I, ha I brought a stainless steel one, but they're Japanese, old Japanese knives, so I, I do have to take care of them to keep them sharp. But too sharp is not good, right? Because the blunt is not good. Uh, I think it's sharpening is important, but also taking care of it every day, wiping it after each use. Because I, I notice that a lot of time when people come to my cooking class, they'll cut something and they just leave it there. And it's one of the things you do is you have a uh, a towel, right? A wet towel and a dry towel, and you wipe it with a wet towel and you finish it with a dry towel. Uh, I wanted to point out that a lot of like cuisine-specific books have maybe 10, 20 uh, pages dedicated to like, here's the pantry, here's the ingredients, but your book, uh, very much not so. It has an entire, maybe third of the book, I think, is completely dedicated to just the Japanese pantry. Yeah. Um, why, why is there so much more focus on the pantry for your book? Because I think for most cooks in America, I always felt like the pantry was a mystery. And 
you go to a, a, a Japanese market and you already feel like you're lost because you can't, you can't understand the ingredients. You'll see miso, like you asked about the miso. There's so many misos. What is the white miso? What is the you know, red miso? And I thought, well, you know, I'm not, I don't want to write an encyclopedia, uh, but I do want to guide uh, my students to the pantry so that you have some background. And um, yeah, I mean, same with like Italian cuisine or Persian cuisine. You always want to understand the pantry of those distinct cuisines because without understanding it, you just don't know how much to use or how to store them. Like a lot, a lot of times my uh, students take the bonito, they open it and they leave it in their pantry. No. Once you open it, it's gonna oxidize. You have to put it in the fridge or freezer. Otherwise it will go brown, you know, it would just rot basically. You know, it would just absorb the oxygen and it won't be flaky like that. Same with nori, you open the package, you gotta close it right away. Uh, so these are little, you know, little instructions that I, pointers that I give to you so that you know what to do when you come across these ingredients because storage is very important too. Um, and I basically learned by watching my mother and my grandma. You know, they just do it without even, you know, I just say, oh, that's what they're doing. And I just remember from memory. And um, it was very important for me to share that part of my, my uh, kitchen experience. Uh, well, give, me, give a great round of applause for Silicon Thank Center you. for coming out tonight. Thank you very much.